All right, so we got a new version of Bash out. This is Bash 5.3. It was released Saturday, July 5th, 2025. Uh, so we're going to talk about today. We're going to go over some of the cool new features because there are a lot of new features, and I'm really excited about this. Um, I'll tell you right now, there are a ton of new features. Let me just scroll down here so you can see. Actually, I hate this is light mode. Let me go ahead and use in the reader. There we go. Look at this. We got nice little dark mode here. So if we scroll down here, we can see, okay, here's some of the new features. That's awesome. But look at this list. Ready? Look at this. This is incredible. Uh, there's more here that I'm going to go over in this video. I plan on just touching on some of the cool ones that uh, I like from this list, some of the ones that I think are awesome. So, uh, yeah, I guess let's jump into it. I'm going to go ahead and pull up the terminal here, and let's see what we got. So right here, I have a directory with some scripts to illustrate some of the new changes here. If you're interested in these, was it Git Remote Show Origin? They are available on my GitHub. You can go ahead and pull this down, run this, and you're good to go. The only thing you don't get is these two versions of Bash I have compiled. I have Bash 5.2 right here, and I have Bash 5.3 right here. I've compiled these, so now we can actually run the example scripts on the old version and the new version. We can see kind of what's changed and what works and what doesn't work. Uh, so yeah, let's jump into it. I think the first one we have here is, oh, actually, can, uh, I don't know how I'm gonna show both these at the same time. I guess I could do this. Eh, this is kind of awkward. Uh, this one I really, really like. Number, or letter C here. Bash reports the starting line number if an error message about an unterminated compound command like if without a fee. What this means is if you open up an if block, but then you fail to close it or something goes wrong there, the line usually tells you where the problem happened. So like where it failed to close. Sometimes it might just give you the line number of like the, the bottom of the file, which isn't super helpful. This will now show you the if statement that was open that didn't close. Let me, uh, let me show you an example here. So I have a file here, which is called bad script, <laughs> poorly named. Um, let's give that some syntax highlighting here. There we go. So we say if true, echo hello world, else echo goodbye world, and then we put end here. Notice that should be fi, instead we have end, so that's incorrect. Let's go ahead and run this with bash 5.2, this is the old version, bad script, and we can see that line 10, there was a syntax error, unexpected end of file. So line 10, like as you can see, it's not even there. Let's go ahead and run this with bash 5.3. Look at this. This is so much nicer. Line 10 syntax error, unexpected end of file from if command on line three. So you can see that this if command is the culprit here. It was opened, but it was never closed. This is so useful. It's such a small quality of life change, but it's going to be one of these things where as time goes on, it's just going to get cemented. And we're going to be like, how do we live without this? This is incredible. I love this. Uh, so the next one to look at is... Error if regex is invalid. This is super cool. Uh, this is, I, I really like this change. So if you were to use regex in your scripts, uh, here's an example here. I make a regex here that is valid. This regex is completely valid. Dot star, the line starts with dot star, so any character zero or many times, and then ends. This will just match any line, so we'll check to see if Dave matches this line which it will. So we'll print first regex match. Then we'll do this regex. This is invalid. This won't work. We need like a dot or something here or any sort of character to repeat. So this is invalid. This regex will not compile. So let's go ahead and run this with the old version of bash so we can see. Bad regex. As you can see, we just got the first regex match. We didn't get anything for the second regex match. It didn't match. So it was conflating, not matching with um, uh, failing to compile. If we run this with the new version of bash, check this out. This is awesome. We get this nice little error message. Invalid regular expression. It actually shows the regular expression. It tells you what's wrong with it, which is super nice. If there's like a context message around it, it prints this out. That is super nice. That's super awesome. This led me down a little bit of a path. Uh, so let's look at what is it? Regex return is the script that I ended up writing. So we have three little examples here. We do a valid regex that matches. So this regex just looks for a string that starts with Dave and ends, and that's it. So this string will match that. Then we have one here. This is a valid regex, meaning it will compile, but it won't match. And then we have a completely invalid regex, meaning it won't even compile. So let's go ahead and run this with the old one. And we can see that even in the old version of batch or bash, it returns a two. That's interesting. I didn't know that was the case. Uh, it was actually this new feature that caused me to look into this. If we run it here, we get the same thing, but we get this nice error message like I talked about before. But look, this two is really important. I didn't know it returns a two. I don't know if this is consistent. If we can look to see if it returns a two instead of a one to see if a regex was valid, it might give us a way of validating that a regex can be compiled according to bash. I looked at the help page for this 
and we can see that it says exit zero or one. So we're definitely seeing a two up here. I don't know if I'm overlooking something here. I don't know if I discovered a bug. Uh, I'm probably gonna dig into this later, but yeah, that's super interesting. Even if we look at the new version of bash and we say help bracket bracket, we get the same thing, exit zero or one. So it doesn't actually seem to document that it exits two, but it totally does. You can definitely check that way. Again, not sure if that's consistent, not sure if that's in documentation, so I'd be wary of that, but definitely something interesting to know. So like I said, there are a lot of features. We just looked at G and that was only two of the features. So feel free to pull this up in your own time and look through this. There's a ton here. I'm just gonna skim through the ones that I thought were particularly interesting, specifically for me. This one I really liked, feature Q glob sort a new variable to specify how to sort the results of path name expansion name size blocks m time a time c time numeric none this is incredible in ascending or descending order this is amazing so i had to look up some of the documentation for this specifically but this is super useful so what this means is if i have a bunch of files here and i ls them when i print the files but use a glob so let's say a star is a glob i'm going to print the file separated by new lines I get this, they're sorted. They're sorted, um, is it alphanumerically? Not alphanumerically, lexicographically. They're sorted basically alphabetically. That's what happens. There's a cost to this. Um, you may have ran into this, you may not have. Um, on Solaris or you know, Lumos, I run this. I think this flag is different on GNU LS. Basically this gives it to me in reader order. And what that means is that is unsorted. Because sometimes I've dealt with directories in the past that have like, a hundred thousand files in them and when you run ls it has to sort all of them when you do this it has to sort all of them so it has to read them all in you can make it unsorted or sorted however you want so i guess i can give an example of this let's touch let's touch a thousand files dave one all the way up to one thousand all right now we have a thousand fun files there all right so let's look at the script that we have for this specifically uh i think it's yeah glob sort so i wrote this little script where we set glob sort to whatever the first argument of the script is, and then we just do a simple 4f and star echo f. That's all it does. So we can run, let's say, the new version of bash, give it glob sort, and then we can give it whatever um, variable we want here. If we give it nothing, it will do the default sort, which is sorted. But we can pass in things here. So we could say sort by size, and now we've sorted the files by size. It also takes a plus and a minus sign here for ascending or descending, which is super cool. In the documentation, or sorry, at least in the news that I pulled up, which is on this website right here, you can see that it lists none here. This didn't work for me. I actually had to pull up the source code in Bash and look through it. I found no sort. So no sort is what I was talking about earlier. No sort doesn't do any sorting. As far as I can tell, this pulls it in read dir order, which is nice. There's no buffering of this. This just kind of becomes available as it becomes available. So super cool. I'm so glad these options are here. I think this is an awesome feature to have. All right, so the next one is right below it. It's for comp gen. If you've never seen this command, this is for doing like completions in Bash. If you've written like Bash scripts or set up your Bash environment, you probably encountered this. There is now a cap v argument, which takes the variable name. I love this. This is super cool because the way comp gen works is it generates typically the list to standard out and you might have to consume that back into an array. And there can technically be problems with that if you have like new lines or other characters that might show up in your IFS. So why is this useful? Well, let's go over here and we still have those thousand files. So we can do comp gen minus F and this will list all the files that are currently available. We can do comp gen minus V. These are all the variables that are defined, comp gen minus A. These are all the aliases that are available. This is cool, it's a new line separated list, but we can do dash cap name, myvar. And now it's saved it in myvar. So if I were to echo myvar, you can see that we only get one of them. Isn't that kind of weird? Well, it's an array. This is beautiful. It's actually stored in array. When you print an array like that, you get the first element. So we can do this. And now we have every item in that array. You could also use var dump on my var. This is a function that I wrote. This does not come with bash by default, um, but this is a super useful function that I wrote to actually dump variables when you're running like interactively on bash, super useful. This shows you that it is in fact an array. Comp gen returns an array, which is super nice, super useful. We don't have to transfer things over standard out and stuff. We can just kind of use the fact that all this stuff is internal to bash and we get a lot of speed, a lot of performance out of it, which is super nice. All right, so the next one I wanna talk about but i'm going to save till the end of the video is this new form of command substitution because it's amazing i love it it's super interesting and it's a lot so i'm going to save it to the end we're going to jump on to the next one which is this one right here bash underbar monoseconds i love this this is a new new dynamic variable that returns the value of the system's monotonic clock if one is available. So you might've had code where you take like a snapshot in time, you take maybe the current timestamp, the Unix epoch time, you do some work, and then you take the Unix epoch time. Again, you subtract it, and then you know how long that work took. 
it's a little bit fragile if you do that. It's not great if you do that because that clock is subject to drift. It can go up and down. It can be changed with NTP. It could technically move backwards. I could just reset the clock on the machine and then suddenly all that stuff doesn't work the way you expect it to. A monotonic clock is super nice. Your operating system will provide it. it. The number itself is meaningless, but it always is guaranteed to go up and it goes up consistently regardless of you know time zones or drift or NTP or anything like that. So I can give you an example of this. Like I said, it's going to be a meaningless number, but if we do as a bash monotonic, that's not gonna work. I keep forgetting I'm not running that version of, I'm not running the newest bash on this example. I have to run it through this example right here. We have this bash script called mono and then we print it. So if we run that with the old version of bash, you can see that we get nothing. But if we run it with the new one, we can see that we get this. And every time I run it, it keeps ticking upwards. Cause again, it represents the number of seconds, the number of seconds since when, who knows? It doesn't matter. The point is I could return this, do some work, return it again, calculate a difference, and now I have a time delta that isn't going to be modified by NTP. Super nice, super useful, love this feature. All right, so this one is really cool. I like it, it's very simple. It's called bash trap sig. It is the trap signal. So new variable set to do, set to the numeric signal number of the trap being executed while it's running. So trap is how you respond to signals in Bash. Um, so what you can do with this, let's go over here. I have this nice little script. I got rid of those Dave files, they were annoying me. We have this nice little script called trap sig and it uses this new variable bash underbar trap sig. Super useful, super cool. And what we do is we trap my funk with sig int. Sig int is the interrupt signal. This is when I control C the program. So I'm gonna run this with the newest version of bash. We're gonna run trap sig here. It's gonna hang because it's sleeping and I'm gonna control C. We can see that signal is two. So that variable is set, it's set to two. I can do things based on the signals. This will be useful for like debugging or something. Say you wanted to write code where you have the same function gets called for like maybe five different signals that were trapped. You'll know which signal fired off that function. So super useful, super cool. Okay, so this one's pretty cool. The source built-in has a new dash P path option, which will make it use the path argument instead of dollar path to look for the file. So what does that mean? I will show you. Source, again, is how you pull in a bash uh, source code into your current environment. You know, you could like source my bash RC. If I'm writing code, I could source like some library code or something. So in fact, that's what I have. I have some library code here. I have three different files and they're foo, bar, and baz. If we look into them, one echoes bar, one echoes baz, and one echoes foo. I think you can guess which file does what. And then if we look into the source path script, take a look at this. The P argument, we give it the directory. We wanna look for these files and then we give it the file name. So instead of having to specify the absolute path to this file, we can say, hey, look in this directory for that file. We could also say, look in this directory too. Look in that directory, you know, we could keep going. This is in the same format as the dollar path variable is in. So this just allows us to do what was already being done under the hood without having to modify the path variable for the user. So if we run, let's see, bash 5.2, if we run this source path, it will fail because dash P is not uh, recognized. If we do it with bash 5.3, hey, look at that. That's pretty cool. All right, and finally, let's talk about this one. This is the new form of command substitution. So command substitution is typically the dollar sign and then the open parens and you can put a command in there. There's two new forms, open curly brace command with a semicolon. Semicolon is very important, obviously, because if you omit that semicolon, it's going to look like parameter expansion or something like that. So the semicolon kind of lets it know that, hey, this is a command. And then we have this new one where there's a pipe character in front of it. So this captures the output of command without forking a child process and using pipes. So in previous videos, I've showed how you could define a function using parentheses or curly braces. The parentheses create a subshell, the curly braces do not. This follows that same convention, which is very nice. So we're not using parentheses, we're using curly braces, so we are not creating a new environment. It's a little weird at first. I'm I'm gonna show you how this works. I actually think it's really, really cool. It's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be pretty awesome. I actually really like this. Um, so we have, uh, what scripts do we have for this? Actually, I remember whatever. I think I just called it commands. Okay, command substitution one and command substitution two. Very simple, right? All right, so get ready for this. Let's take a look. Look at this. My editor doesn't even think this is valid. Okay, that's how new the syntax is. Let's go out here and let's rerun it with bat. And we can see that even then it kind of highlights a little bit weird. This looks a little bit nicer. I'll use this output just to look at it. So what happens here? We set X equal to one, and then we set out this new variable out equal to this. So inside here, we set X equal to two, and then we call the uname command. So what do you think X is gonna be set to here? And what do you think out is gonna be set to here? The nice thing about this one is really no trickery going on here. It kind of works exactly how you think it would. X is equal to two, out is equal to Darwin. That's the output of the uname command on my machine. So this is really important to note. You can modify variables in here. If we had used parentheses, 
that wouldn't have modified the variable in here. So this runs in the same context of the script. This is just a set of commands and all of the standard out is captured and stored into this variable. Super nice, super convenient. Let's move on to the alternative syntax because this one is a little bit wild. I really like it, but it, it, it's wild. It's really weird to understand it first. So what do we have here? X equals one, this magical variable called reply, we manually set to the empty string. You don't have to do this. I'm just doing it for this example. Um, this You'll see this a lot in Bash. A lot of the built-ins will just write to this variable unless otherwise spe uh, specified. This is no different. So x equals one, reply equals this. Then we do this gnarly syntax. Now here's the cool thing. I wrote it like that, but I'm gonna rewrite it now to make it easier to understand. Again, my my yeah, my editor does not like this. I'm gonna write, I'm gonna write it like this to show this is still valid. I'll, I'll reopen it in batches because it's easier to read. Hopefully this will make it make more sense. Kind of looks like, you know, other languages might have a closure or something. This is a very similar syntax to this. So we open this up, we put the pipe here, and this lets it know that, hey, we want to run these commands in the context of the current executing shell, but this pipe character says, don't capture standard out. This will not be captured. Only what is set manually to reply is what will be returned by this entire expansion. It's a little bit confusing, so let's go ahead and run this. Bash 5.3, command substitution 2. So, what happened here? The first thing we print is hello. Why is that? That's because this echo hello was ran. Literally just go down line by line, and that's how this program is being executed. We set x equal to 1. We set reply equal to an empty string. We set x equal to 2. We echo hello to the screen. We set reply equal to world. And then down here, we have already emitted hello, that already got emitted here. X equal two, of course it does, because we set it here to equal two. Out equals world, of course it does, because that's what we set reply equal to. And then what is in reply here? Nothing, because we set reply up here. So reply is now this magic variable that for the duration of this code is local to this code. So this is super cool. This is super awesome. I love this syntax. I did advent of code last year in Bash. This is going to make it so much faster because we don't have that penalty of having to fork exact code. We can just run it in the exact same context. This is amazing. This is super nice. I haven't even shown you, but of course you can gather exit codes from this and stuff like that. Uh, this is great. So. So yeah, these new features look amazing. I'm super excited for Bash 5.3. I love seeing new features come to this language. I love this language. So yeah, hopefully this is interesting. Yeah, enjoy.